Rob, for that. You know, it is funny, we, we, we sometimes forget that, that we're supposed to be singing to each other and teaching and admonishing each other with this. We're going to actually come up with that in the course of this uh, lesson, just a moment, and uh, we'll bring that up as well. It is a wonderful thing that happened yesterday, and if you missed it, well, I'm sorry. Hopefully you'll get a chance to again, though. We've got other rooms that will need to be painted, other things that need to be done. But one of the sweetest things was Jennifer brought Niani and Jessica, and they had paint brushes and were painting with everybody else. There is nobody too young. And they were the ones that did not get it on the carpet. <laughs> just, just as an aside. And they cleaned the restrooms too. Okay, great. Yeah, that was awesome. Appreciate it, guys. We uh, we are blessed this morning with Sister Nancy here without her cap on. Appreciate seeing her. Praise the Lord. She's doing great. I threatened her that uh, Ray uh, Holmquist and myself were going to get up on each side of her up here together, but she's got so much more hair than we do right now. It's it wouldn't look good, so we didn't do that. It's great to have you all here, and thank you for the songs, Rob. The mind of Christ is what the subject is this morning. It's out of Philippians chapter 2. It's one that I've discussed before, and we've approached it before several times in the course of sermons, in the course of classwork. It's part of our reading this last week, and as I want to try and keep our sermons somewhat related to the readings we're doing, this comes into play as well. But the mind of Christ, why would we even talk about it? I mean, we're talking about the Son of God, aren't we? We're talking about somebody who thinks so much higher than we do that we can't even understand it, who is beyond in every way the compassionate one that we can ever possibly be. I heard someone say something the other day, said we need to, be, have, we need to have hearts of compassion and spines of steel, just like Jesus did. And it was such a powerful way of expressing the concept, the courage to be able to do whatever is necessary, while at the same time having the tender heart that would constantly be looking to see who needs something more than me. And as we go through this, I want you to think of that in terms of yourself as well. You have the mind of Christ. Now we're told that in one place, but we're actually told we're supposed to develop that mind as well. And in the reading this morning, that's basically what he talks about here. So let's go ahead. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is actually a quote from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, where he talks about heart, soul, mind, and strength, actually. We are supposed to love. This hasn't changed since the beginning, has it? This is not something new. This is not something surprising. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Now, this was said to the uh, Israelites initially. Did they do that? Initially they did, didn't they? Did they remain faithful doing that? Ah, that should be a warning to us, shouldn't it? It's easy for us to quit doing what we should be doing. And in this particular case, let's think in terms of us remaining faithful in loving the Lord our God with all our mind, soul, and heart. In Romans chapter 1, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased minds to do what ought not to be done. We know this passage. He's talking about idolaters. He's talking about pagans. He's not talking about us, is he? We should be careful, shouldn't we? In chapter 8 of Romans, to set the mind of the flesh is death, to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Why wouldn't we set the life on the spirit then? Why wouldn't we set our minds on the things that are life and peace? But it's easy for us to slip off into the flesh, isn't it? Whatever the flesh may be in your life. There have been times in my life when it was food. There have been times in your life when it may have been something else. May have been alcohol. May have been drugs. We have several that were former drug addicts in here. They are former drug addicts because they have now set their minds on the spirit. On the mind of Christ rather than upon the mind of the flesh. And that is what makes all the difference. In verse 7, the mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God. How many of you in here this morning came in with the intent to become an enemy of God this morning? Am I the only one? We don't do that, do we? We even will say, if we're asked, are you an enemy of God or a friend of God? I'm a friend of God. 
while I may be just getting through repenting for what I did last night, I'm still going to say I'm a friend of God. I'm not going to say I'm an enemy of God. If our mind is set on the flesh, that's hostile to God. And I think that's a great way to express it. It's a hostility. It's, a, it's an aggressive move on our part to set our minds on the flesh. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And we understand that, at least in principle, that the mind of the flesh is in opposition to God. It's in contrary to God's will. It's an opponent of God. And we know that it is impossible to be saved with that kind of a mind. But we sometimes forget that it cannot understand God either. Well, either we make the tree good, this is out of Matthew, either we make the tree good and its fruit good, or we make the tree bad and its fruit bad. The tree will be known by its fruit. So we say, okay, well, I've, I, uh, I, I'm a good person. I'm a good-hearted person. Where is the fruit to be evident of that? You brood of vipers, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, I have not called you a brood of vipers in a long time, have I? Oh, okay, never. I wouldn't do that. However, Jesus did. And he had very good reason to. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of this evil treasure brings forth evil. The day of judgment, people will give account of every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, verse 33 through 37. What kind of words come out of your mouth? How are we supposed to judge you? How do you, you, know, how do you expect us to know who you are except by what you say? And in this particular time, he was going through and showing that these people were not righteous like they proclaimed to be. They put on this facade that they were the righteous of God, and yet they were the ones who were actually in opposition to God. And in particular, when the Messiah came himself. Romans chapter 11. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? This comes out of the Old Testament. It actually comes out of the Psalms, if I remember correctly. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Who can actually tell God what he needs to do? Anybody in here? Is there anybody in here who has the ability to know God's mind so fully that he could actually express God's will without ever checking to see what God said? We can't do that, can we? We actually start with the mind of the flesh, don't we? We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to start with the mind of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, we always kind of slough that off, say, well, that was them, not us. I mean, the Corinthian church was really divided. They had all kinds of conflicts. We don't have that problem today, do we? Or do we? Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. I'm having a little trouble with the meekness one. Maybe you guys can help me with that some. But that compassionate hearts, you know what that means? That means a lot more than just being compassionate. It means that we have a tender heart We are actually clothed with bowels of mercy. By the way, the Greek word literally means bowels of mercy. So that's kind of weird. Well, the Greeks were weird. What can I say? What they actually thought was that the seat of the emotions of man were not here. We're not here as we describe today. We're actually here. And so they described that. And by the way, when Jesus is moved with mercy, with compassion, Twice in the New Testament it's spoken of, it says that his bowels were moved with compassion. We don't translate that in English today that way, but that's what it was. So when he says we are supposed to have a compassionate heart, what's he talking about? Our whole body is clenched up in compassion for the individual. That's the kind of heart we're supposed to have, compassion. Let the tenderest feelings come in contact with the miseries of the distressed as soon as ever they present themselves. Adam Clark. 
Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. How do we have the mind of Christ? Wouldn't it be good to start here? As the Lord has forgiven us, let us forgive each other. Why is it he says over and over and over and over and over? And, okay, you get the idea. Love one another. Be at peace with each other. It's a constant theme because it's a constant problem. Could it be that it's a constant human problem? And thus, since we're humans trying to be like Christ today, we have the same issues. I think perhaps it is. And we see here this forgiveness is not an option. Christ forgave us, we should also forgive each other. We're supposed to show the same disposition, the same readiness to forgive your offending brethren as Christ showed towards you. It's an important distinction to make sure we understand. First, God forgave us. Then we forgive each other. It's an automatic flowing river, if you would, of forgiveness. And it should be thought of that way, I believe, in our minds as well. Verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. The peace of Christ. I, uh, I see several of Paul's writings where he'll talk about peace. Uh, talks about the peace that passes understanding, for example. Talks about a complete peace. Talks about a fullness of peace. Gives us this idea that we're supposed to be at peace somehow. And yet I see books that come out about Christians needing to be at peace with themselves. And Christians needing to forgive themselves. Christians needing to forgive each other. Christians needing to be at peace in the body of Christ. And I realize, you know, this isn't accomplished yet, is it? This isn't one of those checkoff boxes we can go through and say, okay, I've already done that. No, being at peace is something that is an ongoing struggle in our lives. And I don't know why it is a struggle. I don't, I don't see why it has to be unless we go back to the mind of the flesh. The mind of the flesh requires us to do what's right in our own eyes, to do what we think is best for us, not what's best for God or best for each other. And so we let the mind of the flesh rule us and as a result, we fall out of that grace with God. Let's not do that. The word mentioned here is rule is an interesting word. It's more like that of an umpire or a referee. It was actually used in the Greek mind in terms of the Olympic Games. And it was a person who would be an arbiter or a um, director or in some way a, an adjudicator of issues that might come up in the course of the, of the games. And uh, it, he presided over them, preserved order, and distributed prizes then to the victims. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let it be the one that is the arbiter of what you do next, of what you think, of how you act. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now there's a passage that talks about singing. And we sometimes make it a legal argument. This is not a legal argument. This is an argument about behavior. It's an argument about how we think and how we act. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. By the way, the idea of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that's just an emphasis. He's not distinguishing three different kinds of music. He's actually expressing the idea that we sing to each other and teach each other with this. And in that teaching, we teach and admonish each other. The word admonish is a lot stronger than just well, I'm teaching you. It's one we're actually correcting as well. We're encouraging to better behavior. We're encouraging to better response to God. It has been suggested by Barnes that this is a greater tool for evangelism and teaching than any other tool that we have. Perhaps it is. I don't know. But he says the sacred songs of the church should be imbued with sound evangelical sentiment. And I think that's true. There have been some who have argued that the songs we sing are not really all that good. Um, I've sung them most of my life, so I, I kind of argue with that. But on the other hand, I look through at the words of some of these songs and realize, you know, we're supposed to sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. And sometimes the understanding is not necessarily all that good in some of these songs. And so perhaps we need to rewrite some of the songs or, or write some of our own. That wouldn't be all that bad of a deal, would it? And by the way, the writing of the music is not the issue. It's the writing of the words that we're talking about here. Then he says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, We have received not the spirit of the world, 
with the Spirit of God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. I wish we could take this and just embed it into our mind. Keep it there in our hearts in such a way that it never loses its place. We've received the Spirit that is from God, not from the world. In verse 13, we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now here's a little bit of an argument that you need to kind of consider. I have heard people say that as Christians we need to hold the line firm and not let the country and let the fellow citizens of this world go off and do the wrong thing. That's not what this says, is it? We're talking to each other. We're sharing this with each other. We're not going out there and putting up a sign in front of the temple of Diana and say, don't go to the prostitutes. We're putting up a sign within the body of Christ saying, don't go to the prostitutes of the temple. There's a difference, a big difference. And in fact, here in 1 Corinthians, he goes through and actually expresses that. I believe it's in chapter 5 where he says, what do we have to do with judging people of the world? God's going to do that. We, however, are to judge within ourselves as to whether we're doing the right thing or not. Having the mind of Christ is what it's all about there. All right. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? We come back to this again, don't we? But we have the mind of Christ. Where did we get this mind? We got it from God, didn't we? When did we get this mind? How did we get this mind? Well, I would suggest that we were converted, and thus we got this mind. But if nothing else, we get this mind through the Word of God, don't we? Who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Did I get this training from San Diego State University? Did I get it from Harvard? All right, so I didn't go to Harvard, and I didn't go to San Diego State. Did I get it from Oklahoma Christian? No. By the way, Oklahoma Christian did speak and teach a lot of the mind of Christ. They had a great Bible program there. They had a great uh, preacher boy program, we called it. But that's not where I got it from. I got it, first of all, because I became a Christian. And perhaps that's what he's actually talking about in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when he says we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's what he's talking about, is that we receive the mind of Christ. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I'm just suggesting. Think about it. But we have the mind of Christ. Why, what is it that distinguishes us from the people outside? Is it because we go to a church? We come to worship God once a week? Or twice a week? Or three times a week? Or however many times it may be? That was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Yeah, sorry. Um, is it because we have the name Church of Christ on the front? Is that why we're different than the people out there? Or could it be that this is the difference? We are different because we have the mind of Christ. That should be the difference, shouldn't it? A mind of Christ filled with compassion, filled with joy, filled with peace. A mind that is filled with meekness. A mind that is filled with uh, generosity, that is filled with love for each other. A mind that is different than what they think. A mind that's not looking out for itself, but looking after the interest of others. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. There's that united mind concept. But say, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Philippians 2, verse 1 and following. Of one mind. It's not just that we have the mind of Christ, we have the one mind of Christ. We have the oneness of the mind of Christ. We have the unity in the mind of Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, verse 5. What kind of a mind can we get from Jesus? Who, when he's sitting with his disciples up on uh, north in the Galilee region, and word comes to them that Lazarus is dying, a friend of theirs, a beloved friend of theirs, Mary and Martha's brother, and uh, he goes back to just whatever he's doing there. They've got a campfire going. Maybe there's dinner cooking. I don't know. And uh, the brethren there say, well, aren't you going to get up and go down there? You could heal him. You can save him. 
And Jesus says, no, he's already gone. He's already asleep. What do you mean he's already asleep? You can still heal him. No, he's already died. Well, what are you waiting for then? Our minds would say, get up and run, wouldn't it? His mind says, there's time. Do you realize that Lazarus was in the tomb for three days? Why was that? It's been suggested that there was a belief in the mind of the Jews of that time that three days, it took three days for the spirit to leave the body. There was no question that Lazarus was dead by this point. He was gone. And Jesus comes and says, Lazarus, come forth. What kind of a mind would, would think that way? That'd be an awfully devious mind, wouldn't it? Oh, we wouldn't use the word devious. We would use something else, wouldn't we? But it would have to be the mind of God. It would have to be a mind that said, he's just asleep. How about the other thinking? Uh, The woman comes in with an alabaster cruise of oil and begins to anoint his feet. And with her tears, she anoints his feet and wipes it with her hair. And the disciples argue, man, that could have been sold and given to the poor. Not meaning it really, but thinking that way, the mind of the flesh, money is everything, right? Jesus says, she's preparing me for burial. Wow. Do you think that way? Christ did. How about when he goes into the temple? He sees the money changers and he sees the uh, sacrifices there waiting to be sold to whoever comes in getting ready for the work that's to be done in the temple. And we would walk in and we'd kind of shrug it off like that's the way business is done, isn't it? Uh, It's okay. Nothing wrong with this. Move along. There's nothing to see. Jesus doesn't do that, though. What does he do? Somebody made a point once, and I think it's a good point. He didn't just get real angry and just rush over and start throwing over the tables. He calmly and intently and intentionally gathered up the materials he needed to make that cat of nine tails, to make that whip. Then he leaned up against the wall there next to the tables and made that whip. What you making, Lord? Oh, you'll see in a minute. Maybe that's what happened. He didn't do it out of a rage of just blowing up all of a sudden, and we can excuse him later. Oh, I just lost control. No, he intentionally went about what he had to do. And when he got through, he quotes the scripture. They quote the scripture, I must have zeal for my father's house. The temple was still the temple of God at that point, wasn't it? The Israelites had made it a money changer's den. Had made it something that was dirty and sullen and was not as pretty as what God had intended for it to be. We don't think that way though, do we? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was equal with God, thought not being equal with God a thing to be grasped. Several different translations on this, kind of interesting. Something to be taken advantage of was read in our our reading this morning. Uh, Something to be held on to, that's the grasping concept. Something to be kept, Uh, I don't want to lose this, so I'm going to hold on to it no matter what. Equal with God. Now, wait a minute, guys. How can we have the mind of Christ when he was equal with God? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. Without him, nothing was made. Jesus was the process or the avenue through which creation occurred. Uh, Any physicists in here? Uh, Electronics uh, engineers? Yeah, we got some electrical engineering people around here. Do you understand everything about the physics involved with all of that? No. Do the scientists understand everything? No. No, they don't. It's fascinating to me to see what we don't know And every time we find out something new that opens up a whole new avenue of questions. But we think we know it all. No, but God does, doesn't he? And God knew the hearts of men. Jesus constantly is referred to that way. 
Can we know the hearts of men? No. Not the way he did, which was a miraculous manner. But we can discern behaviors. Here he says, though he was equal with God, he didn't think it was something to be held on to. But he emptied himself. Powerful statement of emptying himself. What did he have to do to empty himself of what became, what made him God? You and I will never know. Or perhaps we'll know when we get there. I have a feeling it won't be important for us when we get there. But we cannot know what it was that he emptied himself of, except it was the essence of deity in order to become like a man. When we empty ourselves of ourselves, however, we can know what we're talking about there. Get rid of the mind of the flesh. Get rid of the thinking that says, I'm more important than anything else. I have a right to do this. I have, oh, by the way, I hear that all the time. Marriage counseling. Two people come. Well, he doesn't have a right. Or I don't have, you know, I've got the right for happiness. Where did they get that idea, by the way? We get it from Disney movies. We get it from Grimm's Fairy Tales, which, by the way, those usually didn't end out very nicely, did they? Uh, we get it from fantasy, from Hollywood, not from real life. We've got to get rid of that kind of thinking. We've got to become a servant mindset. What did Jesus do? He learned, obe he learned uh, obedience by what he suffered. What have we suffered that would lead us to obedience? It's hard to answer that question sometimes. Oh, we may point to something, and there may actually be something in some of our lives, but most of us haven't suffered like Christ has, and for sure. We're supposed to have the mindset of Christ. Being found in human form, he humbled himself. By, there, by the way, that's a good word, isn't it? Humble. Humility. How many of us would go before God with a brash attitude? God, I deserve to be here. I've got a bone to pick with you. Anybody in here going to do that? Not even you, Kendrick? Okay. Just checking. Just checking. Nobody would do that, would we? You remember when the children of Israel were around the mountain in Exodus 19? That was a beautiful expression there, David, as you went through that the other night. By the way, David's... Uh, DVDs and CDs and lesson plans are on the table out front. Be sure and get that on the subject of holiness from this last weekend. Be sure and get your copy. There were six CDs, three DVDs, and give all the money to, well, no, no they're free. <coughs> they came up to the mountain, said, Moses, you go up. We're going to stay here. Then God put a perimeter around the mountain and says, they don't touch it. Don't let them touch it or they die. The people didn't want to go up anyway. They were terrified of the holiness of God. They were impressed with the God of the universe in that moment and in that place. We're not going to do anything that's not humble before God. The question is whether we're going to humble ourselves now or later. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. By the way, if you don't remember where this is, this is where that's at. This is the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. By the way, why does he say that? For emphasis. That's all it is. There's no place left out. Everybody who went to hell before the time period or went to punishment before the time period in which Christ came are going to bow down and proclaim him as Lord. But it's too late. And in our lives, we must proclaim him as Lord now, not later. But there's going to come a time when every knee shall bow and every voice will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it'll all be to the glory of God the Father, which we should be doing now, shouldn't we? The psalmist says, Prove me, O Lord, and try me, test my heart, and my mind. We should take it a, a bit of a, a lesson from the psalmist in this regard that we should be tested by God as well. But that's a scary thing to be tested by God, isn't it? The psalmist also says, hold fast 
they, the enemies, his enemies, hold fast to their evil purposes. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking who can see them. They search out injustice, saying we've accomplished a diligent search. For the inward mind and heart of man are deep. That's not really a very good translation. It's just really trying to show that man tries to hide what his true intent is. What his selfish ambitions really are. Man tries to hide what he really wants from God, and God, of course, sees right through him. He can't hide from him. And so we have this proverb saying, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is, one, it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Mind of man will not accomplish his will. Whoever uses, trusts in his own mind is a fool. He who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Proverbs again. Do you trust in your own mind? God calls you a fool if you do. People outside this building this morning are trusting in their own mind. People outside of this group are trusting in their own mind. This group is supposed to have the mind of Christ. We're not supposed to be trusting in our own mind. And here in Revelation, he closes out with a neat thought. It's a terrifying thought, but it's a thought nevertheless we should consider. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. All the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. Now, by the way, he's not talking to churches here. He's talking to individuals, isn't he? He's talking to a church. But he's talking to the individuals in that church, isn't he? He's telling them that you will be judged according to your works. You need to have the mind and heart that God can search and find nothing wrong with it. Should I repeat that or is that enough? I think it's enough, isn't it? So the next question is, do you have a mind and heart that is pure so that God can search it and not find anything wrong with it? Or are you one of those who need to repent? As he tells them here, they need to repent. As we all need to repent. And we need to come to him having that mind, the mind of the spirit, not the mind of the flesh. A mind that says, I want to do what's right with God no matter what it costs me. Or even especially what it costs me. But the mind of Christ is what we're striving for. So let's go ahead right now. If you have a need to come to God to reestablish the mind of Christ, if you have a need to, uh, to repent, to purify yourself again, to become truly holy again, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?